Good evening. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Facebook Live event. I am uh, Jim Mitchell. I'm very happy to take a few minutes to join us on Facebook and uh, kind of experiment here on this new technology. We're going to talk today about uh, those of you who might be interested in starting your own business. We're going to provide some guidance and uh, help to get you through that. And uh, our expert to help us uh, comes to us from Lavelle Law. He's a uh, managing partner there, attorney Ted McGinn. Ted, how are you tonight? I'm doing great, Jim. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is pretty exciting. And what we want to do is encourage uh, the people who stop in on Facebook to check us out to uh, feel free to send us questions. It's the Lavelle Law website or uh, Lavelle Law uh, page on Facebook. And uh, just shoot us a question. We'll try and answer that. But we've got some other content to cover tonight. But before we do that, if you're sort of new to Lavelle Law, you don't know a lot about the firm, you don't know Ted's background, let's talk about that. Tell me about the, the practice itself. Well, Lavelle Law Limited, we're a full service law firm and our main office is located at 501 West Colfax Street in Palatine. We also have an office in Chicago mm -hmm. at 180 North LaSalle Street. As I said, we're a full service firm. We handle a number of different practice areas obviously including business, uh, business law, mm -hmm. but beyond that, we also get involved with commercial litigation, uh, real estate, both commercial and residential transactions. We have a booming estate planning practice group. We also have attorneys that do family law, which includes uh, child custody issues and mm -hmm. divorce. Uh, we have a, an attorney uh, that handles bankruptcy work. And then we recently started an uh, immigration practice group. So we have a wide range of different practice areas. And how many different attorneys cover those groups? Well, we typically have uh, two to three different attorneys in a, in a particular practice group. Okay. Each of our attorneys focus on a couple different areas. The reason we set it up that way is a client is going to get an attorney who focuses their area or their practice in that particular area. So they're going to a higher quality of service. Sure. And in total, how many attorneys, how many staff are part of Lavelle Law? We have 26 attorneys right now. Okay. Uh, a lot of uh, different topics we could cover there, but tonight we're going to focus primarily on the business law practice. Um, we want to talk about uh, those of you who are entrepreneurs, people who want to get started on your own business. And uh, when we talk about business law, there's a lot of different things that go into it. So tell us a little bit about that practice group in particular. Uh, well, before we jump into that, Jim, I want to kind of give you a little bit of perspective okay. and mm -hmm. the philosophy that we have here at Lavelle Law in our business practice group. Uh, we understand that operating a business or starting a business is very challenging to deliver a product or a service at a fair price, you know, that's, that's very difficult. And mm -hmm. at the same time, you're keeping competitors at bay. So we get that. Uh, and then in addition, of course, there are a number of legal issues that uh, any sort of business is going to encounter mm -hmm. from time to time. So having a lawyer that can guide you through the, uh, that, that business uh, is critical. And not just an attorney, but someone that can do it in a cost-effective way. Uh, you know, I've seen many situations where a lawyer will come in uh, you know, over lawyer a situation, okay. blow a, uh, a matter up unnecessarily, client ends up with a, just a ridiculous uh, legal bill. We get involved, we get hired as mm -hmm. a result of that. You know, clients come to us with problems from their prior attorneys, uh, over lawyering a case. So we always operate from a cost benefit standpoint from the client's perspective. Uh, so, you know, we're there for them and we're going to provide legal solutions in a cost effective way. So you're really looking for things that they need help with, not just things that you could be doing. You're, you're trying to say, like, here's where we can add value. Otherwise, you kind of stay right. on Right. I mean, we recognize the business, they're going to make a decision, mm -hmm. but they need to be equipped with all the relevant legal information and let them make the appropriate decision. Now, we're not going to uh, make the, the decision or the legal issue about Lavelle Law. It's about right. the business. You know, we're there to provide them the information they need to make an informed uh, business decision. And we're talking tonight about uh, the process of starting a business, but I assume that once that relationship is established and you've built that trust, you can probably serve that client for many years as your business grows and evolves in different ways. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like I said, uh, a business is going to encounter tremendous amount of issues from time to time, from the startup through the day-to-day -day matters, dealing with customers, dealing with vendors, dealing with employees, commercial leases, whatever the case may be. Uh, we are a one-stop shop for businesses. We look at ourselves as a, as a source for, for clients to come in, have all their legal matters taken care of. Well, and as we reference that point, we want to again encourage you, if you're on Facebook, to uh, send any questions you over, uh, have over tonight to us, and that's the uh, Lavelle Law Facebook page. Um, and we'll give you later phone number and uh, email and website to follow up after uh, our live event here. So um, establishing that philosophy, now let's go ahead and talk about the practice group a little bit mm -hmm. and some of the services that would be provided uh, through Lavelle Law. Well, it starts with 
formation of businesses. That's mm -hmm. a key decision that needs to be made. Uh, what, what is appropriate structure? From there, we can move on to dealing with day-to-day -day contracts. Uh, also, transactions that come up from time to time, uh, whether they're selling or buying a business or whatever their position is on mm -hmm. that particular transaction, we can advise them in that. Uh, both state and federal taxation becomes an issue. Uh, and then uh, later on down the road, exit strategy. So we look to be, we want to be there from the beginning to the end. And I like, uh, you know, the title of our uh, live event today is you, you've got a great idea, now what? And, and I think sometimes people do have those great ideas. They're very anxious to start their business. Um, as you alluded to, it's a very difficult process and a, and a lot of first time businesses unfortunately fail. Um, as someone has that energy and excitement and is ready to go, are there certain things they should be doing really before they even open the doors from a legal perspective to make sure that their business is established on, on sound footing? Well, I think identifying the right structure is the place to start. There's okay. a number of different ways you can operate, a, create a business, uh, anywhere from a sole proprietorship to a corporation, a partnership, a limited liability company. That's a fundamental initial decision that needs to be made. And of course, there's various pros and cons for each sort of business structure. Mm -hmm. And any business owner, they have to make the decision that's best for them based upon their particular needs. And uh, so that falls into the category. You see a, a corporate name, and it's followed by, you know, Inc. or LLC. Those are actual terms that have specific designations and different meaning to that type of a company. Right. Inc., Limited, Corp., that mm -hmm. all indicates that's a corporation. Uh, company, you know, LLC, that's a limited liability company. Uh, both of those are uh, very popular because mm -hmm. it provides what we know, what lawyers refer to as limited liability. One of the you know primary reasons of setting a corporation is that you want to insulate your assets, your personal assets, from the claims of the creditors. That's known as limited liability, and the only structures that provide that would be a corporation or a limited liability company. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you have a sole proprietorship. Very easy to set up. The problem with it, though, it's unlimited liability. That means that the individual who owns that sole proprietorship is liable for all the, uh, the, the, the debts mm -hmm. of that particular business. Creditors can resort to your personal assets. Corporation, not the case. With a corporation, um, a creditor can resort to the assets of the company, but the general rule is they can't seek to, to collect on their claims against the assets that belong to the individual owner of that corporation. So it sort of sets a level of uh, protection for the business owners. Exactly. Provides some uh, comfort for them that, they, that the, you know, when they're engaging and jumping into this business, which could be very risky, mm -hmm. they know that their personal assets are safe from the claims of those creditors. Now, of course, there's exceptions. Creditors certainly understand limited liability just as well as attorneys understand it. So many times a, an owner is going to be asked to sign a personal guarantee. Uh, you'll see that very common with a, a bank or perhaps a commercial lease. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is one way that those creditors can kind of get around the limited liability. I would always encourage any business owner who's faced with that question, should I sign a personal guarantee, should I not? I would always recommend that they do whatever they can to avoid doing that. Now. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it comes down to a matter of leverage, you know, yeah. a case where a lender is going to, hey, if you, we'll lend you the money, but you need a personal guarantee. At that point, the business owner may not have much of a choice. However, initially, I think they should push back on signing yeah. personal guarantees. So let me ask you about a particular instance that comes to mind, and I'm glad you mentioned that because it leads right into it. Someone's starting a business, and they, they need capital, they need some funds to get started, uh, and maybe a family member or a friend says, yeah, I'll, you know, let me get in on that with you. And, you know, what could be more exciting than having people support you and, sure. and want to go into business with you? Um, does that get a little dangerous, though, in terms of working with family and friends? And, and do, you, do, you, do you see people overlook the fact that it's a business and they have to put things in writing and really know who does what before they start? Yeah, it really can get dangerous. I think the most important thing is clearly identifying at the very beginning what is the nature of their involvement in this business. Yeah, anytime you're going to put money in the business, it's characterized as, as either debt or equity. If it's going to be debt, that means the individual is lending the money to the business mm -hmm. and there should be an expectation that that money is going to be repaid at some point in time in the future. Equity, on the other hand, is a, a, you, you put the money in, in return you receive shares of stock or ownership of the company. Uh, if the company is successful, well then that individual who made that contribution in return for equity is going to benefit. On the other hand, if the business fails, 
then they're going to lose their investment at that point. So, but that needs to be defined at the very beginning because if it's not defined later on down the road, there's going to be confusion. And then if it's a family situation, someone's not going uh, yeah. home for Thanksgiving because they're <laughs> not happy with what happened. They feel like they got ripped off. So sure. uh, just clarity is important. Having that relationship defined at the very beginning is and important. Is, is one of the key roles of a business attorney, uh, the, the types of service you can provide, helping understand that just about everything you do at the beginning should be put in writing. I mean, there's just value in having that done. Yeah, I think there's tremendous value getting things in writing. I mean, first of all, making sure they understand what the various options are, mm -hmm. you know, what the, uh, you know, like I said, the debt or equity, you know, there's a number of ways to do it. Once that is presented to the clients, they can then inform us how they want to have it handled. And then, of course, you put it in writing. Having it in writing is just terribly important because it just eliminates any sort of confusion, any sort of ambiguity in the future. Uh, what happens quite often is, you know, two or three years go down the road and then sometimes memory gets a little hazy. People mm -hmm. don't remember exactly what was said. And uh, interesting enough, the memory is always favorable towards you and the other party's memory is favorable towards them. And then you end up having uh, uh, a dispute on your hands, hiring, uh, you know, attorneys to litigate the matter. So. Uh, getting it in writing kind of avoids those sort of problems or, or minimizes Minim them. Sure, great. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, uh, Laval Law Facebook page is where we are at tonight and uh, send a question over if you have it. And in the future, if you want to follow up with Ted or any of the attorneys, first of all, uh, LavelleLaw.com is the website, very comprehensive website, a great deal of information there. And the office phone number 847-705-7555. You guys are also very active on Twitter and, and uh, Facebook, LinkedIn. So a lot of ways to follow and get in touch with uh, Lavelle Law. I want to go back to the documents. Let's talk about some of the things that um, give some specific examples of things that should be put in writing, whether it's, you know, obviously your, your uh, corporation process, but shareholder agreements and some contracts and things. Just kind of walk through a few things that come to mind that uh, you want to build a library of. Sure. Well, when you're starting a company, if it's a corporation, the first basic document that's created is the Articles of Incorporation. Mm -hmm. LLC is called Articles of Organization. Those documents are filed with the Secretary of State. The next step, you want to apply for and obtain a tax ID number from the Internal Revenue Service. And that's the basic fundamental document to set up the entity. But going beyond that, you start getting into the capital structure, the relationships of the various owners, and that's where you start getting into shareholder agreements, or in the case of an LLC, operating agreements and those mm -hmm. documents can define you know who owns what what are the roles of the various individuals are they going to be employed by the company if so what's their compensation structure going to be when are profits going to be distributed how are major decisions going to be made all that should be in writing so again the parties understand what the expectations are mm -hmm. they know in advance you know if they're, are they on the same page or not and they find out early on if they have a different perspective on how they're going to run their business, maybe they don't get into business after, at all. You know? yeah. And you find that out early on rather than after the fact, in which case the matter, you, know, you, you get into litigation where it gets even more costly. And then there's probably a similar relationship with uh, vendors, suppliers, and, and, and customers. Uh, for maybe manufacturing or other companies that are providing goods and services. You need to always operate on a good contract. And, and can you create a template that you sort of use going forward? And if so, what, what, what are the basic elements a contract should have? Yeah, I mean, once you get the structure and setup done mm -hmm. and you, you move on to the day-to-day -day operations, I think a, a contract is something you need to have. Uh, businesses deal with transactions all the time. Uh, that's what they do. And uh, the best way to protect yourself in any sort of transaction is to have a writing, a written contract. Contrary mm -hmm. to popular belief, oral contracts can be enforced but you have problems because the issue becomes what was the agreement? Right. Nobody really knows what the agreement is. He said, she said sort of situation. So getting it in writing is very important. And what you want in writing, you want to make sure you understand what, are, what is the obligation of the other party, number one. Number two, what is your obligation? Mm -hmm. When are those uh, duties required to be performed? Uh, all that needs to be spelled out in writing. Again, it just eliminates any sort of confusion uh, down and uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So um, you had mentioned earlier as well, um, you know, kind of defining the roles within the company. And I think for a new company, employees are going to be one of the greatest assets of the company. Uh, you want to secure some good people, whether they're your sales guy or your uh, office uh, operations manager. Um, does it make sense to have uh, a contract or an employee agreement with, with your key people to, to sort of secure their, their role? 
Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the, on the employee that we're talking about. I mean, typically with a basic clerical worker, you may not run, the, you mm -hmm. may not need to have a formal written contract. Mm -hmm. But when you start getting into higher level individuals, higher compensated individuals, sometimes having a contract is kind of important. You want to, again, it, it puts it in writing so it's very clear on what the expectations are of each party. Uh, first of all, what's the compensation package? What is, what is this person going to be paid? Mm -hmm. What are the benefits for this person? Vacation, uh, expense reimbursement, there's a number of issues you may want to put in writing. Um, you know, what are this person's duties? Who is this person going to report to? All that should be spelled out. Uh, finally, you get into intellectual property. A company may have certain trade secrets or confidential information and you may want to protect that. The way to do that is that you can include certain restrictive covenants in that contract and then of course you need to have an attorney to talk about enforceability of these sure. restrictive covenants uh, that may be beyond the scope of today's discussion but that is something that you would want in that contract to protect that intellectual property. Restrictive covenants is the way to do that. And that uh, leads to another question because that deals with the employee but what about the product or the company name or the processes, uh, is that a trademark issue? Is that something that gets dealt with as well? Yeah, more and more today, companies deal with intellectual property. There's a number of different types of intellectual property. When, you know, that could be a patent, mm -hmm. could be a trademark, could be a copyright, and it could be a trade secret. Intellectual property refers to any sort of asset that you can't really physically touch, an intangible. Uh, uh, trademarks are something very valuable today and there's certain steps you can take to protect those trademarks and if you take the appropriate steps you gain uh, additional protections and, and most importantly and, and we haven't talked about this yet is the right to recover your attorney fees. Okay. Um, to jump back a little bit in a contract you want to have a provision <clears throat> in the written contract that allows you to recover your attorney fees. And w without that if you have to enforce a contract you have to pay your attorney of course mm -hmm. whatever you recover is offset by the fees you pay your lawyer. On the other hand, if you have a provision in the contract that allows you to recover your attorney fees, those fees are added on top of the amount that you're recovering in that particular lawsuit. So that's very important to have that in the contract. Now moving forward again to the intellectual property, mm -hmm. registering a trademark enables you the right to recover your attorney fees in the case of infringement. So those are some steps you need to take to protect that, that intellectual property, plus it, it, it improves your position when you get in a case of infringement. Now. Um some things like that, like uh, establishing your trademark, registering your, your name, whatever it is. Um, we're talking about, boy, someone looks at this and says there's a lot to do here. But some of those are, I don't say simple steps, but they're just basic steps that should be taken and they're really not that intrusive to someone trying to start a business. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it, well, I, they're basic steps. I think they're important to take. Mm -hmm. As I said at the very beginning, you always look at this from a cost-benefit standpoint. And we understand there's certain resources a company's going to have. And a business needs to decide what's important, what's, what's more important at this point in time. Now, as a company uh, starts growing and starts gaining more and more customers, maybe some of these intellectual property issues become more and more important. On the other hand, you may have an asset that's so critically important at the very beginning. If you don't protect that, and that leaks away through an employee leaving, going to a competitor, or the, someone infringing on, mm -hmm. that, on that particular trademark, you may be, your business may be destroyed before you get up and running. So that's a decision that a business owner needs to make. Okay. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about employees because you had mentioned that not every employee needs a contract and agreement. But what about the role of the employee handbook? That's something that I think gets overlooked a lot. And, and tell me what the value of that is. Well, employee handbook is a document that you can create that puts it out in writing, again, the philosophies and policies of a business. Uh, it can deal with anything from paid time off or vacation or sick leave. Overtime is something you may want to have in there. You know, today, today uh, social media mm -hmm. policy is important to have. Uh, you know, and more and more people are out on Facebook, out on the internet, and, and, and making statements out there. You want to make sure that they're not saying things that they shouldn't be saying that could look poorly upon the business, and you want to deal with that in the, in the employee handbook. Um, also, it's important to have your employees sign an acknowledgement that they have actually received the handbook. Otherwise, you may face with an argument, hey, I didn't know about it, I didn't mm -hmm. get it. Um, now, one other thing I would also add is if you're going to adopt a handbook, it is critical that you consistently follow those policies. 
if you follow certain policies on one time, later on you don't follow the policy, you're exposing yourself to a claim of discrimination. You know, why did you, you know, allow this person to do that, but you didn't yeah. allow that person? Mm -hmm. They could argue that you, the reason behind that is because you're discriminating. So if you're going to adopt an employee handbook, it is important that those, follow, uh, those policies are followed consistently throughout. And then what's the frequency of updating that handbook once you have it established? Is it something that gets done annually or, or some period of time? Yeah, I think it would be prudent to look at it on an annual basis. And, you know, I mean, there's always changes in the law, uh, and sometimes those changes could impact uh, your relationship with your employees. And if you don't update policies, you could find out that you're violating applicable law. So I think that's something that should be looked at at least on an annual basis. We're uh, kind of reviewing some of the things that uh, you might want to know if you're going to start a new business, if you've got the entrepreneurial spirit. I'm with uh, Ted McGinn, the uh, managing partner of Lavelle Law. Glad to have you with us on this Facebook Live event. Uh, when we're done, again, uh, LavelleLaw.com is a website for you to visit. And 847-705-7555 uh, is the phone number. And you'll always get a quick uh, prompt response from an attorney there. And you see on the screen uh, Ted's email address as well if you want to shoot a question over to him after the fact. Um, we've talked a lot, Ted, about um, new businesses and what it means to establish, but I know your, your folks also work with established businesses. Let's say you've helped them start, they get things up and running, and uh, now they've got an opportunity to buy another business or merge businesses, uh, uh, start getting into uh, bringing two different companies together. Um, how can you assist in that regard? Yeah, we have a significant amount of experience in merger and acquisition or buying and selling businesses. Uh, obviously, it depends on who we represent. Do we represent the buyer? Do we represent the seller? Mm -hmm. uh, but we can provide a lot of value either way. When you're in the buying standpoint, you're the buyer, you want to make sure that you have a right to conduct your due diligence so you understand exactly what you're buying into. Second of all, you want to make sure the definitive agreement that is signed at closing contains the certain representations that the buyer can rely upon and, and it codify in writing what the seller is promising to the buyer. Now, representing the seller, on the other hand, uh, the most important thing is making sure he's getting paid. You know, mm -hmm. he, he's selling his business for a certain amount of uh, consideration, and you want to make sure he knows exactly what he's getting at closing, when he's going to get the rest, and you want to make sure there's certain protections in that definitive agreement so if the buyer doesn't pay, then the seller has recourse against that buyer. And beyond that, when we talk, probably the last thing someone starting a new business would think about was exiting the business. But um, there's, there's something called succession planning, which is, uh, you know, what happens when someone is successful and they want to retire. Um, and what's involved in that in terms of, of how someone should think about, if, if they've built a good business, not just walking away from it. Sure, yeah. I mean, we see it happening more and more <clears throat> as uh, generations age and get older. We have uh, a lot of businesses out there that have some value. Now, uh, on one hand, they could just simply close the door, walk, go mm -hmm. home, and turn off the lights. Uh, on the other hand, that, doing that, you're going to lose out on a lot of value. So it's always prudent to start thinking about succession. And you can't just wait until a few weeks before you're going to close the door. You yeah. want to lead up into that. So there's certain things that you can do. I would always recommend that you sit down with a CPA to talk about the books, look over the financial statements, because if you're going to sell the business to some outsider, they're going to want to look at the financial statements. And, mm -hmm. and there may be certain... Um, activity that you have done in the past that may not be um, advantageous when you show your business to a buyer. Uh, in addition, there could be some thoughts uh, from transfer, transferring it to the next, your children. You know, mm -hmm. That could be a possibility as well. And uh, what we always do at Lavelle Law, we work our, with our estate planning group and sometimes the exit strategy works with estate planning at the same time. So, uh, But the point is that uh, if you have a business that has value, uh, it's just, uh, you know, a, a wise thing to do to start thinking about the future a few years in advance and start taking some steps today so when the time comes, the business is in a good position for you can sell it and, and recover all that value. And, and before we wrap up and let you go, you just mentioned something that I think is very important and it's going to allow me to plug Lavelle Law a little bit, but you mentioned, you know, going over the estate planning group. Um, once a business is up and running, they're going to have tax issues and that may require a, a tax attorney. Uh, they're going to have probably some employment issues which require an employment law type of view. By having multiple practice groups, is, is it advantageous to you then to be able to just walk them right down the hall and keep them there and, and not have to have them go find another attorney that does this and one that does that? Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the beauty, uh, beautiful things of Level Law. We have a number of different practice groups. We all work together. 
uh, you know, in the business setting, a lot of issues, real estate come into play all the time, mm -hmm. or estate planning comes into play, or litigation comes into play. Uh, all those issues could impact the business from time to time. In Lavelle Law, as I said before, we have attorneys who focus on a number of different practice areas. So if there is a real estate issue or there is an estate planning issue, I can certainly walk down the hall, find one of our attorneys in that particular area, get guidance right away. Mm -hmm. Uh, some other firm, uh, a, a business may have to go out there, find a different attorney and go out there and, and it just delays and slows the whole process up. So we all work together. It's an efficient way for our clients and it works well. Well, I think uh, hopefully we've provided some good guidance for people tonight and uh, uh, we, we've worked our way through about a half an hour here already. Uh, any last thoughts, someone who's out there is really on the fence about starting a new business, can you just you know maybe give them a little wrap up to, to tell them some of the things that they should be thinking about and, and, and ways to go about it the right way? Well, I think you're going to start a new business. You, you really need to sit down with an attorney. And, uh, and I'm not saying that just to run up legal fees. Mm -hmm. There's so many problems that come up from time to time. And without a proper legal guidance, those problems become much worse. And that means more expensive on down the road. We would always sit down with, with any new client, provide them a free consultation, hear what their concerns are, hear what their objectives are, explain to them what, you know, what our suggestions would be. And um, you know, I think that's the, the way to go. That's yeah. a prudent way to start your business. Have an attorney ready to go and guide that business through its life. Yeah. Uh, Ted McGinn, the uh, managing partner at Lavelle Law, has been the guest tonight. We uh, have had a blast being here on Facebook on the Lavelle Law page. And again, let me send you over to uh, uh, LavelleLaw.com for more information. Uh, you've got all the information on the screen there for the uh, social channels. Uh, we encourage you to follow along there and uh, reach out to Ted or any of the attorneys at 847-705-7555, uh, LavelleLaw.com. Uh, Ted, thanks for being here, and uh, certainly thanks to everyone who uh, tucked in tonight and took a look. We'll look forward to maybe doing this again. Thanks, Jim.